Susan Fleur, welcome to the SAP Vlog series. Today we're looking at your paper on process-based temporal coordination in multi-party collaboration. And fittingly, we have the two of you as co-authors here. The paper has been very recently published on strategic organization that is in 2022 and was written together with also Hans Behrens and Philip Tilcher. Welcome Fleur, welcome Susan. Thanks. Thanks for the invite. It's really nice to be here. So good to have you. So your paper focuses on pacing, which is a very interesting topic. So you investigate process time as opposed to clock time and propose three pacing practices that are different from synchronization. These are leveraging serendipitous alignment, temporary exclusion, and alignment on the future. Interestingly, you discuss how temporary complexities may resurface over time and may require reinitiation of joint action, building on previous episodes. So this is a very short summary. What is missing? What is missing from the summary? I think it's a very good summary. Um, I, I think I would just like to add a little bit about uh, why this is. Uh, why, why we study this and why this is interesting. So, so the idea was basically that in these multi-party collaborations or inter-organizational collaborations, you have all these different um, actors or parties, organizations that have their own uh, temporal structure. And that means like the way that they organize around time that can be pacing or how they look at the future, how far ahead in the future, uh, the different rhythms. So we were interested in to see how how you can temporarily coordinate activities in these kind of collaborations, because if each has their own temporal structure, how do you make sure that you all um, can work together? So, so that was basically the motivation of the study. And then if you think about that, then, then you can also understand how, how difficult it must be to uh, synchronize these activities according to clock time. Um, so that would be, of course, you can do planning, but we also know that that is not, not very easy to achieve. Um, and, and it's actually also what we saw when we when we did the case study, that we didn't really see these kind of clock time-based mechanisms. Um, so that actually aligned uh, very well. And that's why we started to look into, okay, so what are they doing then um, to temporarily coordinate and, and overcome these, these, these potential clashes between uh, temporal structures? So yeah, and then and then there was actually uh, this process time way of of, um, of um, coordinating activities that that we saw around um, events, uh, for example. Yeah. Cool, Fleur. You look like you have something on your mind. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have the paper on our mind, of course. No, like Susan said, I think um, the, the the sort of yeah, this, these really new forms of collaboration that we see, especially I think in Europe all around. So these living lab, field labs, um, open innovation labs, they all depart from this idea that having different parties involved with different knowledge, resources, different perspectives on the problem is important and essential for tackling the complex problems we face as a society. But at the same time, I think it's easy to, to overlook how difficult it is to get this going. And I think we came at this paper from an understanding of interorganizational collaboration and from an understanding of innovation. So the fact that these problems are wicked and difficult to grasp, uh, we kind of assumed that, but I think what really surprised us what, was how far these collaborations um, departed from what we know from literature on interorganizational collaboration, right? So I think alliances, consortia, um, and I think these new forms of collaboration, they have its own challenges. And I think it's in that sense, a very novel context that we studied. Um, and the people in the living lab were sometimes very frustrated with the process. And Susan, I can remember <laughs> you in particular also being frustrated sometimes you know how, how is this collaboration working so we were really challenged by um yeah by the phenomenon we studied really trying to grasp like susan said so how do they do it so things are coming out they, things are happening outcomes are produced but how do they do it 
Yeah, because we also, for me, as an, uh, I was trying to do some observations as well, trying to see, so where do these actors meet? When do they coordinate? But they didn't have any of these recording meetings, for example, and it seemed all kind of, it was very difficult to, to grasp, basically. And, and I think that was because they didn't have these, like, uh, more clock time based uh, coordination mechanisms in place, but uh, but still they were able to do that. So that was really an interesting puzzle uh, and also frustrating uh, at times. But uh, but yeah, because they have been so successful uh, in, in getting things going. So it was actually all these little projects that they had ongoing and somehow they came together at points and, you know, all together accumulated in, in, in a big thing. So that was that was quite interesting to uh, for us to understand as researchers, so so how did they uh, did they achieve that? Yeah, that's so interesting. I mean, to be honest, I thought about writing my second PhD paper pretty much a year ago. I had this conversation with my supervisor on pacing practices by entrepreneurs. So is faster always better? And if no, maybe maybe they maybe they use active practices. So one thought I had when I read your paper was on the you know say difference between practices and mechanisms and also on the topic of agency because you're you're looking at mechanisms sort of right like um leveraging serendipitous alignment or to what degree is there is there active agency involved to what degree do authors uh, do do um do actors you know push these on on their collaborators and to what degree is it emergent Yeah, that was an interesting question, right, Susan? I think also in the review process. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. Oh, do I touch on something touchy? I'm sorry. <laughs> no, 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 not at all. No, I think, for example, the, the thing with the serendipitous alignment, because at serendipity is also something that well, we can discuss about that, right? Like, is that something that you can manage or is it something that emerges and it's like chance or luck or coincidence? But but I think the fact that they also leverage these moments, I think I think it's important to, to also see because I think they have been very good at also capturing these moments and making use of, of these moments where they were aligned. Um, yeah, a very short answer. <laughs> yeah, but I think that's exactly where the agency is, right? So it's, it's, you could almost expect, I think, in collaborations like these, such serendipitous opportunities um, to arrive. Indeed, they emerge, but still it requires people to be aware of them and to then also act upon it. And if you come at these collaborations from, say, a project management approach, you're likely not going to be sensitive to these moments, right? Because you have certain planning and certain milestones in mind. And I think that's an, an, like an agentic orientation that could easily lead you to overlook everything in front of you. And I think exactly because in these collaborations, I have people lack such a clear defined goal and lack such a, you know, sort of standard project planning, um, they were also searching, okay, so what is it we're here for? And they were constantly revising, but also because of that sort of open-endedness or ambiguity, they were seeing new possibilities. And I think that's exactly why, um, these collaborations, <clears throat> you could even see them as a structure for people to engage in such agency. Very interesting. And in this perspective, these three mechanisms are somewhat mutually exclusive. So you can't have the same people who are open-minded, serendipitous oriented versus those who are aligning on the future or how do the mechanisms relate to each other? Um... You mean the, the aligning to the future versus the other or? So from what Fleur said, it looked like the people who are very goal oriented and outcome oriented and looking like, so that's where we want to go. And guys, let's, let's go here. And then somebody says, you know, let's go with there. And then people say, okay, let's go there. And so this comes at the exclusion. Mm -hmm. Everybody would be like that, entering the project with this kind of goal alignment and there would basically be no difference between process and clock time because everybody is just okay now we have to go right it's like it's like time right um whereas when you have actors who are more like open and you are like they are like oh but look now we are here and we have this you know this opportunity serendipity um then you start to, to introduce process time because then you like that's like 
how I took it, right? But I might be mistaken. So yeah, like just so diversity in actors or how does how does that go? Yeah. Yeah, so if you think about how they aligned on the future, for example, it was not like, okay, in you know two years, we need to be there. So it was very fussy and very fake, um, these ideas that they had. So because they were not so concrete, so you know, if, if you would think about aligning on the future and, and you set maybe goals uh, on a on certain point in time, that would be clock time, right? But, but in, in this case, for example, they were quite ambiguous uh, and, and, and not very concrete about it, but they had just, you know, this little, this big vision that everyone could fit into uh, with their own temporal horizons. So I think that that is a little, little different from maybe, um, you know, the more project uh, management kind of way of, of planning on the future. So, so that was also one of these mechanisms that, that, that we saw. So I think that's maybe also a little bit different uh, way of looking at, at planning for, the, you know, on the future, if that, if that makes sense. <laughs> a lot, yeah, cool, great. Um, so, so how did you come to, to, to study that phenomenon? Like what, what was the motivation for, for doing that? Um, yeah, I have to also dig, but uh, this uh, this was uh, my first um, yeah case study from my PhD actually. So it's been a while since I started, and um, yeah, it just started with this overall interest in in, in uh, temporal complexity actually. So uh, and interorganizational collaboration because that's what we're all doing. Uh, but then yeah, so really yeah, really like like the paper set out to do um, is. is this is what we were interested in, uh, yeah. And then it has been uh, quite a struggle because studying time is, is, is very difficult. Uh, I think it's very, an, like an intangible thing. Um, you cannot really ask questions directly about it in interviews. It was difficult to also code for it. So um, yeah, I think it has been a very challenging uh, uh, project to study uh, empirically. And then also in this setting where you have these different organizations that all are all yeah are all over and dispersed so uh, I, I think uh yeah that that was that was it right Fleur? <laughs> if I remember. yeah definitely and i can remember that um we um or you managed to get access uh, via one of the um i think one of the initiating organizations um but of course yeah susan had to get in touch with all the other parties and also gain their trust and their commitments. Um, and I remember actually our own surprise that all of a sudden there were these new companies involved. We were like, how did we miss it? But then we found out that some of the companies involved and the other organizations also missed their involvement. So that's how sort of dispersed and emergent um, this collaboration really was. And I think, yeah, you, you asked, why did we study it? So I think in general, I'm really intrigued by these new forms of collaboration. There's, I think this consensus emerging that to tackle the challenges of our time, we need, you know, people coming at problems from different perspectives, from different knowledge bases. But like I said before, I think we really don't understand enough yet. So I think when we, when we, um, study these uh, these collaborations with the yeah the literature we have on on interorganizational collaboration we really don't get that far because these collaborations don't resemble um, the kind of collaborations we know well at all so it's not just the uncertainty it's also the the fluid membership how is it possible that three of the initiating organizations were unaware that another organization had entered their collaboration right that's just impossible from an alliance or a, um or in our an r d consortia um uh, perspective but this is what happens and we see these collaborations, not just in the Netherlands, um, but also, yeah, as I know many of them in Helsinki, but also increasingly in the US. So I think we really need to sort of tackle how we can make most of what we seem to sort of generally believe in, that uh, we need people to come together to solve the complex problems, like the safety problem that was um, the orientation of this particular living lab. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that's a very good point because I think the starting point was actually more this like 
I think maybe you had also maybe too simple idea of, of how this collaboration was working, uh, coming from the literature and, uh, and our own experiences, and then finding out how, you know, how complex it actually was and emergent and, and diverse. So, yeah. I think that I mean, was just, part of the learnings as well. Yeah. Yeah. So just as you said, like the first PhD paper, so I guess it was actually quite a, quite a path to the first paper because you had to solve many problems right you had to find the the phenomenon you had to find the research question but you also needed to find a coding way and an interview guideline to capture notions of time but there's not so much out there in the literature yet on this yeah yes exactly yeah that was uh, I, and i think there it was also important that um, you know i had my experienced co-authors because I was at the several points where I probably would have given up <laughs> on this, yeah. page. but uh, but uh, yeah, I think that was that was very important, and uh, I also remember that we've been looking at uh, interview transcripts together, uh, making sense of it together, and and I think what was very important here is is maybe not so much the coding, but like all the discussions that we had together. So you know, we met uh, like biweekly or so, just to discuss. You know, when I had an interview, I could just talk about it and. And we all had this really deep knowledge of, of what was going on in the case. So uh, I think I think it was quite essential. And then and then basically what we did is we, we traced back. So you know where where just this, these these episodes where they actually achieved uh, like this joint action, what we what we call in the paper joint action. So and then and then we traced back. So what what actually happened there? Um, and then going back to our to our coding. Yeah. So so how did you like? The collaborative process that's what you're talking about and i think it's super interesting because it's a team of four that produced the paper and that had to also align temporarily of course but then also you already you know made some big steps forward in the first place was your phd paper yeah so um yeah I, yeah i took a long time of course gathering the data uh, making sense of it and you know that was that was of course a whole process and then and then this call came up uh, for for the a special issue on temporal work and actually that was that was a great serendipitous alignment uh, i would say <laughs> because uh, i think that helped a lot as well for us to uh, you know get going with it again and and also you know um, work on the framing and how we saw it and uh, yeah i think i think that was an interesting process by itself so of course you know it was developing the paper and then this this whole writing process uh, uh, and this this process with the journal and and with the editors and the reviewers, I think I think that helped a lot. Actually, also the reviewer comments of making sense of what of what we saw because we had these nice rich descriptions and, and how we looked at things. But uh, I think it has has you know gotten even nicer in in, in the review process. So uh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. No, I'm also I'm also thinking back about these collaborations, they take a long time, right? So uh, you traced certain events back to when it emerged. Um, but then I think for three years, um, you were more or less involved at different intensities. And I think that's something really challenging, especially when you take a practice approach and you really want to understand it from the perspective of the actors involved, really understanding where they're coming from, um, uh, really doing this embedded research that we also do in, um, in our research group. I think on the one hand, that's ideally suited to study collaborations like this, but at the same time, it requires a lot of patience and persistence, right, to follow things through. And um, I think in your PhD, it was great that you could also switch to, um, to other uh, papers and other studies that were a bit, that weren't so like longitudinal so that we could even publish these papers before this particular piece so i think that's um, that's just in general a very challenging if you if you have a phenomena that's really unfolding on the one hand i think that's great and really well suited for strategy practice and process research but it does require a lot of patience and persistence to uh, to follow it through so i think that's uh, um, at times we were a bit worn out with the data and uh, and all the twists and turns that uh, that emerged um, but then when you look back at it it's just one big you know exciting journey but once you're in it it can be very tiring <laughs> indeed 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think I think that's really true. So I think it was this really long process of gathering data, making sense, and then and then we had breaks in between where, where we didn't work on it for a long time, and then we picked it up again, and then and I think things accelerated again when we had this uh, this call. Uh, I think now uh, looking back, I think this has become a really nice paper. But uh, if I compare it to my other uh, PhD uh, papers, then yeah, I think this one was the most tough to to work on, but uh, I think the outcome has been so nice. And uh, yeah, maybe nice. one more thing yeah. about the yeah. about the collaboration. Um, we also had a bit of a, a backstory, right, Susan, on on our own temporal <laughs> yeah, structures yeah. and misalignments and <laughs> complexities because this happens. This 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 the special issue call. The deadline was quite close to our uh, both of our due dates for the pregnancy. <laughs> and then the revision <laughs> came, and you know, with strategic organization, it's kind of a fast-paced journal with quick turnaround times uh, and strict deadlines, especially because of the uh, the special issue. So we were <laughs> juggling a maternity leave with a revision. So often we felt like we know what it's like to coordinate um, with uh, like temporal structures that are certainly misaligned. So yeah. But on the other hand, we were very aligned because it, when we gave birth, it was only like a few hours in between. Yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so, uh, so I remember sitting here with, with my son in, in his chair and, and Fleur was also working. Oh, no, no, I need to go. I need to feed the baby. And yeah, yeah, me too. And then we got back to it. So so I think we were also very aligned uh, serendipitously um, <laughs> because we were all exactly in the same uh, <laughs> phases with our kids. So, uh, yeah. Beautiful. Yeah, yeah. I think we are lost without serendipity, like in general, in life and in many projects. Um, it's such a great, great place to, to see how this, you know, how this, how this um, comes up in, in research and in, in the field of, 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 of research which you're doing. Yes, we are at the end of the interview already. Um, I've enjoyed it a lot. Thank you for sharing these insights um, with our viewers and keep on learning everybody who watches this and keep on doing this kind of research the, the two of you it's super interesting thank you so much thank you <laughs> thanks a lot